Good evening. Uh, my name is Sangmi Park. I'll be the MC for tonight's uh, lecture. It is my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you to the 73rd Sokietas Korean Lecture. Now it's time for me to introduce today's speaker, uh, Professor Charu Lee. Since uh, Dr. Yang gave some introduction of Dr. Charu Lee, uh, I'll just add a few uh, more uh, pieces of information uh, regarding his past experience and education. Um, Dr. Charu Lee is currently the pro a professor of law at the Yonsei University Law School. And for his education, he has uh, a BA and master's degree in law from Seoul National University. And he acquired another master's degree in law from Georgetown University Law Center. And uh, he also earned a PhD in law from London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, before he became a professor at Yonsei University Law School, he also taught at Hankook University of Foreign Studies and Songkyungwan University, um, where he taught international law and other related courses. I'll just um, read a few of, uh, among many, a few titles of uh, his publication. Um, <coughs> Most recently, he wrote, uh, he was the author of Country Report of the Republic of Korea uh, for the European Union Democracy Observatory on Citizenship. And uh, he published an article on the judicialization of politics in South Korea. He also published an article on the law and politics of citizenship, also related to today's topic in Divided Korea. And just uh, one more uh, article that I'd like to introduce is, how can you say you're a Korean? Law, governmentality, and national membership in South Korea. He also served on many academic associations, uh, both as uh, chair and president, and also as members. And also he was uh, the former chairperson and member of the special committee on national, nationality law amendment of the Ministry of Justice, Government of the Republic of Korea. Now, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Charul Lee, to you. Please give him a warm welcome. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, profoundly grateful to uh, the Academy of Korean Studies and particularly Professor Yang Yong Yun for giving me this um, precious opportunity to give a, a speech at this, um, in this prestigious forum, uh, Sokia Test Koreana. Um, uh, a few years ago, I was called upon to serve uh, as a member in a, uh, some sort of um, organizing committee for the Sokia um, Koreana, uh, but I never expected that I would be um, invited as a speaker, and I'm very happy and um, I feel honored uh, to have this chance. Um, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Professor Park Sang-mi um, for chairing this discussion, and um, a few years ago, um, I, I, I chaired um, when she uh, gave a, a lecture here. Uh, and I think what she's doing today is far more than a, far more than a, um, just the reciprocation to my service on that occasion. Um, I would also like to thank uh, Professor uh, Ms. Kanyong Mi for his marvelous, her marvelous assistance in the build up to this event. Um, I thank you, um, all of you, for attending this um, this talk, and um, um, I hope um, I can give you some some you know, pieces of information to um, stimulate your ideas and um, a discussion um, after this, um, my talk. Um, my, talk, my title uh, is The Logic of Citizenship and National Membership in Korea, and so many things can be talked about under this title. Uh, you may be interested in how uh, the acquisition of Korean citizenship by immigrants, um, particularly uh, recently, you, you probably must have seen um, uh, the you know, Winter Olympics where uh, there are many 
uh, Western uh, players um, uh, playing in as, as Korean nationals. Um, this kind of you know, special naturalization for uh, talented people. I mean, this kind of um, interesting arrangements are there in uh, the Korean citizenship regime, and um, you may be very much interested in those issues. But today, I'm going to focus on uh, three questions mainly. And so these are um, how Koreans have become um, ROK citizens, and how the Korean nation has been differentiated into different legal categories of people, and whether and to what extent Korea's membership regime is imbued with ethnic nationalism. Um, I'm going to address these questions with reference to two backgrounds that complicate um, uh, the um, notion and rules of citizenship and um, national membership in the Republic of Korea. The first is um, national division. Um, I, would, I, I will explain how uh, the two citizen rates, um, the ROK and the DPRK or South or North uh, on this peninsula, um, have be been formed into, um, out of uh, the, same, the same nation, same proto-national, proto-nation. Secondly, I will um, give a short um, uh, introduction to uh, the treatment of North Koreans in the, um, the Republic of Korea's um, citizenship regime. Um, and um, this, the, the other background is the wave of emigrations uh, diasporic movements uh, in the 19th century and um, uh, their ethnic return migrations um, that started in the post-Cold War period. Um, related issues are the separation of the members of the Korean diaspora in China and um, in the so uh, from the Soviet Union um, and their separation, their legal separation um, from uh, the um, uh, Republic of Korea's citizenry and um, how a preferential, preferential status has been developed for these so-called kin foreigners. Um, this special status can be called um, ethnicity, and um, this concept, I will elaborate on this concept later. Um, I'd like to um, give a, you know, clarify uh, some of the basic terms that I'm using this, in this speech. Uh, citizenship. Uh, citizenship, um, well, everyone knows what citizenship is, but um, if I define it, uh, I, can be, I can say that it is a, a full legal um, membership of a state. Uh, but uh, international lawyers uh, rarely use the term citizenship. They prefer the term nationality. And nationality is defined as um, the legal bond between an individual and the state. It doesn't really mean anything. Um, so more accurately, we can define it as a quality, the quality of uh, an individual uh, being a subject of a, nation, uh, a state. Then uh, in most cases, um, citizenship and nationality coincide with, it, with it, each other. In most countries, they do. Um, I think uh, many of you are from uh, European countries, and I think, um, uh, and um, uh, you know, in most European countries, citizenship and um, nationality uh, square with each other. But there are countries uh, in which citizenship and nationality do not coincide with each other. Uh, one example is the United States. There are people who are nationals but not citizens of the United States. Uh, people born on the outlying positions of the United States. Uh, for example, uh, American Samoa and Swain's Island, people born there uh, do not acquire U.S. citizenship. They, they are just um, U.S. nationals. Um, in Korea, uh, the term nationality, it is, um, the corresponding term to nationality is gukja. Uh, and um, Koreans believe that um, all Koreans, all people who have the Korean gukja are full equal citizens of the Republic of Korea. Um, I will accept, tentatively, I will accept uh, this assumption and uh, use citizenship and nationality interchangeably, but I will introduce some cases where you will see some, some sort of split between citizenship and nationality, and that will stimulate um, our, you know, so we will wonder whether um, we need um, new terminologies 
to reflect this kind of split between uh, citizenship and nationality. Uh, so I will uh, come up with this um, uh, issue later. The last and uh, the, the strangest term is ethnicenship, uh, as I said. Uh, so the Austrian uh, political scientist Rainer Baubeck introduced the, the, this term and he defined it as an external quasi-citizenship for individuals who are neither citizens nor residents of the country granting that status. I mean, he's, what he has in mind is uh, some uh, European experiences, European cases, like um, the Hungar Hungary's status law. Uh, but um, because I think um, these, uh, these ethnicity practices are very widespread, um, I expanded uh, the definition a little bit further and um, I will define this term as a preferential status given by a kin state to its ethnic kin in or from other states. And uh, we will see how ethnicity practices are taking place in, in Korea. Um, at this point, uh, before, uh, before I uh, move on to the next slide, um, I believe that uh, many of you think um, the Korean notion of identity is very, very ethnic. At least Koreans have a very strong ethnic notion of nationhood. Um, people probably would point to many, many sides of um, Korea's membership practices. Um, ethnicity is one example. But some people would point to uh, Korea sticking to the youth and witness principle as the principle of conferring citizenship at birth. You know, Koreans, most Koreans have become Koreans because their parents were Korean. So this so-called youth and witness principle or the, the principle of blood or principle of descent. Uh, many people point to um, this as a, as a symptom of Korea's um, ethnic mindedness or ethnic notion of um, nationhood and uh, contrast it with uh, the youth solely adopted by countries like the United States, uh, the, the principle of territory. People born on the United States, in the, in the United States, become U US citizens at birth, right? Um, but at this point, um, I'd like to uh, introduce this uh, book, interesting book by uh, the UCLA uh, sociology professor, Roger Sprubaker, uh, Citizenship and Nationhood in France and Germany, uh, published in 1992. Um, Roger Brubaker in this book contrasts uh, France and Germany. Um, they will, by reference to their different understandings of of nationhood. Uh, for example, he he characterizes the French notion as civic and territorial, and he characterizes the German notion as very ethnic, and he associates. Uh, the French notion with the introduction of use solely elements in the French nationality law uh, in comparison to the German Nationality Act where um, you know, use uh, sanguinis has been the main principle and well in Germany only as late as in 2000 uh, some elements of use sanguinis uh, solely uh, were introduced but uh, the main principle is um, uh, very uh, strongly use sanguinis based and um, he so he makes this kind of distinction and against this uh, Patrick Vail uh, comes up a, a, a counter argument against this uh, Patrick Vail is a French um, citizenship scholar and his award-winning award book uh, Guess Comme Français says that uh, Brubeck is wrong uh, because uh, he uh, overlooks the fact that uh, France was the inventor of use and witness, which was a, a republican principle as opposed to the, to the Ancien Regime principle of use solely. Uh, uh, during the Ancien Regime, use solely was a principle and if anyone born on the French territory should be, should be loyal to the monarch and that was the main idea of use solely. Uh, so the French, after the French Revolution, the France had to replace uh, the use solely principle and use sanguinis came up as, a, uh, as an alternative and as a republican principle. So according to um, Patrick Vail, uh, it is absurd to 
uh, uh, you know, pair Eastern Venice with ethnic notion of nationhood and usually uh, with um, uh, the civic notion of nationhood. And Eastern Venice itself has not, it should not be uh, identified with a kind of um, an illustration of a racialized uh, notion of nationhood. Um, so this makes um, Koreans feel a little bit comfortable, maybe. Uh, but as this use and witness um, entails the question of who are the initial citizens from whom citizenship is transmitted? Um, you know, any nation that has this principle faces the same question. Right? And in Korea, who are the initial citizens of the Republic of Korea? Um, the first Nationality Act of the Republic of Korea was enacted in 1948, um, a few months after the government of the Republic of Korea was established. That was in December uh, that, when that uh, law was enacted, and it was only a few, few months after uh, the government of the Republic of Korea was established. And uh, the act goes like this, a person whose father is a national of the Republic of Korea, when the person is born, acquires uh, nationality, the nationality of, of the Republic of Korea at, at, at birth. I think uh, most Koreans became uh, ROK citizens on the basis of this paragraph. Then the question is, if the Republic of Korea was born in 1948, uh, how those people uh, the father, you know, the parents, the father uh, could get uh, obtain uh, is, uh, is the nationality of Republic of Korea. Right? Um, that sounds a little bit um, contradictory. Um, but the drafters of the of this act deliberately omitted a provision that defines who these people were, who were the initial citizens of the Republic of Korea, because. What they tried to mean by the Republic of Korea was not the Republic of Korea whose government was established in 1948. Um, they tried to mean by the Republic of Korea the Korean state, the historic Korean state past, and as well as the new republic born in 1948. In their minds, the Republic of Korea never ceased to exist. Um, despite Japanese occupation. And its, its population, its national population, um, had been naturally carried over into the citizenry of the Republic of Korea. So there was no need, no need to define the initial citizenry. Uh, interestingly, uh, the drafters of uh, the Nationality Act did not mention, did mention um, um, a, a law that preceded, that preceded the Nationality Act. Um, during the military government, uh, the US, US Army military government in Korea, uh, which came to an end as the Republic of Korea came to have a government, um, a law was enacted uh, the temporary provisions concerning the law of nationality. And that law defined Joseon national and uh, Korean nationality. They, you know, the purpose of the law was to define who were Koreans as opposed to people, you know, Japanese, uh, particularly Japanese, because they had to be sent uh, back to Japan and their assets had to be confiscated and so on. So, but, you know, the, very belatedly, all these, um, you know, uh, projects had already finished by the time when uh, these, this legislation was enacted. But anyway, the purpose of, our, purpose of this legislation was to define the boundaries of the Korean nation. And it says, a person whose, oh, well, I made a mistake, a person whose father was a Chosonian, that means Korean, um, has Joseon, uh, when, when, when he was born, has Korean Joseon or Korean nationality. There was some, some mistake. I have to correct it. Um, then the question is, who are these people? Who are Joseon people? Who are Koreans? Who are who and some who had the Joseon nationality? Um, it is also very interesting that 
um, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea's Nationality Act, indeed the, the North Korea's uh, Nationality Act, contains a similar notion. Um, and some, some critics of, of South Korea's nationality law contrast it with that of North Korea, in that North Korea has, uh, the North Korean Nationality Act has a provision that defines who the initial citizens of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea were. And that provision is this. Citizens of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea are persons who possessed the nationality of Joseon, Korea, prior to the establishment of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and their offspring. Well, there is a definition, but this definition doesn't solve the fundamental problem. We have to know who these people are, you know, who the Joseon, uh, Joseon people were. And um, we believe that all these people, all these groups, Joseon nationals in the temporary provisions uh, of the, on the law of nationality, and Joseon nationals under the DPRK Nationality Act, and ROK nationals as conceived by the drafters of the Nationality Act of 1948, these, all, all these groups are, are the same, the, mean the same, same group. Former subjects of the Joseon dynasty, uh, later Taehanjigu, or the Empire of Korea, and their lineal descendants. And how this, you know, this, this, this group is a kind of um, a, you know, Koreans believe that, you know, all Koreans, South and North, you know, originate from this group. And this group is thought to be you know, internally, um, you know, coherent and externally bounded group. Uh, but how this, you know, this guy, but I think um, this, uh, this belief that Koreans think that their Koreanness is something very clearly given. It's not very ground, it's, it's not groundless because the Korean nation was formed, not formed, but at some point it was, it had that kind of boundary. It came to have that kind of very clear boundary thanks to Japanese rule. Uh, when Japan occupied Korea uh, and other territories, uh, they put all these subjects of the Japanese Empire into family registries. They recorded, they documented all individuals of the empire. But they applied different family registries to different parts, different peoples of the empire. For example, Taiwanese, Koreans, Chosenjin, uh, and people of Karafuto, all the, they have, uh, these people had uh, family registries separate from you know, people in the mainland, uh, the Japanese proper. So a kind of, um, there's kind of ethnic minded, what should, what should governmentality in, in, which is a term used by Michel Foucault in documenting and um, um, identifying uh, the individual members of the population. I mean, this very, uh, this rationality of population management was unfolded, it unfolded in a very ethnic minded way and um, you know, as a result, the Korean nation had, came to have this kind of very clear-cut boundaries. And this uh, has been inherited by the Republic of Korea as its citizenry. So it is not wrong for, Korea, for Koreans to believe that the Korean nation and the ROK citizenry has a very, very clear-cut boundaries. Well, but uh, because um, uh, Koreans believe that their Koreanness is, is, is so, you know, they take it for, for granted that they ne never question how, how they became um, Korean citizens and the citizens of the Republic of Korea. This question did not come up uh, in, in any kind of official way until mid the mid 1990s when South Koreans came to encounter 
uh, an increasing number of North Koreans coming from China. And uh, there was a case uh, uh, where a woman named Lee Young-sun was involved. Um, and that was the first case where um, you know, which, which explained, officially explained why North Koreans are citizens of the Republic of Korea. And also, this is the first case that explains how all citizens of the Republic of Korea came to become, uh, you know, came to be uh, recognized as citizens of the Republic of Korea. Um, Lee Young Sun was a. She was born in 1937, and she um, uh, married a Korean Chinese husband. So uh, her husband was a Chinese citizen, and they traveled to Korea and as with, uh, on a Chinese passport. Um, her Chinese passport, passport was a forged passport, and um, they operated a restaurant. And um, uh, Lee Young Sun's husband uh, was murdered, uh, and Lee Young Sun decided to settle permanently in South Korea. So she turned up in, turned up in the police station saying that she was North Korean. So she was entitled to uh, the citizenship of the Republic of Korea and could live in uh, the Republic of Korea. But the police didn't, uh, and immigration authorities didn't believe that she was a, a uh, North Korean. Uh, instead, they believe that she was a, an, an undocumented Chinese immigrant. So they decided to deport uh, Lee Young Sun, and Lee Young Sun uh, filed a suit in court. And the Seoul High Court and the Supreme Court judged that Lee Young Sun was North Korean, and so she was. She was a citizen of the Republic of Korea. And um, the, the court's reason that um, Koreans became ROK citizens, uh, be, 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 you know, before Koreans became ROK citizens, they were uh, Joseon nationals under the temporary provisions of the law, under law of nationality under uh, the uh, US military government. And uh, when the Korean, the Republic of Korea's constitution was promulgated and came into force in uh, July the 17th, uh, 1948, they became the citizens of the Republic of Korea. Um, and, uh, and that means all cities, and, and also uh, the, the court said that because the sovereignty of uh, the Republic of Korea extended to the northern part of the peninsula, um, Lee Young Sun's DPRK citizenship would not affect it's not recognized by South Korea and would not affect her uh, citizenship of the Republic of Korea. That means most North Koreans are citizens of the Republic of Korea, wherever, wherever they live. Um, but I think, um, I, I think it is true. Uh, most North Koreans also derive their origin from the the nation, the Korean nation, um, conceived by the drafters of the uh, ROK Nationality Act, or the drafters of the temporary provisions, and also the drafters of the uh, Nationality Act of North Korea themselves. Um, but so, mo in most cases, um, you know, chosen nationality under the um, DPRK Nationality Act and the ROK citizenship would coincide. But there are, in, there are gaps between um, North Korean and South Korean nationality laws. One, exa yeah, one example is uh, Kim Gwang-ho's case shows an example. Kim Gwang-ho was a, um, a guy who came to Korea on a, uh, you know, he, he came to Korea as an undocumented um, migrant. And he later, when he, he also received a deportation order, and then he challenged that by saying that he was North Korean, and he, so he was an ROK citizen. But the problem was, his, his father was a Chinese citizen at the time when he was born. His mother was North Korean, though. Um, and he, so at that time, um, South Korea had only a patrilineal 
you sanguine is rule. It's only when your father is, in the, is a South, uh, uh, citizen that you become a citizen. Doesn't matter whether you are, I mean, if your father is a foreigner, it doesn't matter whether you have, your, your mother is Korean, uh, because you cannot, well, in any case, you, you, you cannot acquire Korean citizenship. That is this kind of um, gender unequal, uh, you sanguine is rule. But North Korea at that time had this gender equal bilineal you sanguinist rule. And he said this gender unequal you sanguinist rule was unconstitutional. And the district court referred the case to the constitutional court. When the, when the case was pending in the constitutional court, the National Assembly amended the rule and introduced the patrilineal, also uh, bilineal you sanguinist rule, the maid. You um, sanguine is both amatra and patra, and um, but nevertheless, uh, Kim Gang failed to obtain, uh, you know, ROK citizenship because um, he was born too early, uh, so he failed. But anyway, this shows that this, there there can be this kind of gap between North Korean law and South Korean law. Um, another example is um, the treatment of national minorities in the DPRK Constitution of 1948. Um, the DPRK Constitution of the 1948 says uh, national minorities, there are the national minorities who possess the citizenship of the DPRK enjoy the same, the equal rights as other DPRK citizens. Um, that presupposes that there are national minorities who are citizens of the DPRK. And I think um, what they had in mind was Chinese, ethnic Chinese uh, in North, North Korea. At that time, about 20,000 ethnic Chinese, or Hua Chiao, uh, how to pronounce it? Yeah. Uh, and uh, it was the people in North Korea. And um, according to the if South Korean law, they would not be recognized as South Korean citizens because um, you know, their parents were not South Korean. But nevertheless, DPRK gave citizenship to those people. And what if, what if they come to Korea, then would South Korea recognize them as North Korean citizens or ROK citizens? No, I no. Because when they judge one's citizenship, a North Korean citizen, um, whether a, North, a person from North Korea has ROK citizenship, they made the make their judgment on the basis of South Korean nationality law, not North Korean law. So they, fa they would fail to be recognized as ROK citizens. There may be naturalized DPRK citizens uh, because their naturalization would not be recognized by South Korea. So this kind of gap would happen. Right? And, um, the, and the Federal Republic of Germany also had this kind of problem because um, the, uh, you know, both GDR and FDR uh, the, you know, derived their uh, citizenship from the same law, the Reich's uh, Nationality Act of 1913. But at some point in 1967, uh, East Germany changed its position and came to have a separate, separate uh, concept of citizenship. And so there were East German citizens who were not West German citizens, who, who could not be you know, recognized as uh, you know, Germans. Uh, and after the unification, the you know, Federal Republic of Germany had to deal with these people. Right? And um, they had to introduce some flexible uh, ways to uh, you know, find whether they, these people treat, how to treat these people, whether to treat them as citizens or not. Uh, another question that arises is whether North Koreans are dual nationals. Um, because they have, you know, South Korea and North Korea are two separate states in international law. And so, DPRK citizens outside of uh, the DPRK, um, they can be treated as dual nationals because um, South Korea extends uh, its nationality to these people too. Then the problem arises, the biggest problem arises when um, they claim the refugee status, when they apply for refugee re status. Uh, because under the uh, convention relating to the status of refugees, a dual, nationals, uh, a dual national should 
be can you know no no mem uh, you know state party state parties are not obliged to give protection to a dual national who has not availed himself of the protection of his the other country right and um, without well-founded fear, of, uh, except when, well, you know, unless there was a well-founded fear of persecution, right? So they, a refugee, a dual national refugee has to, has to, you know, satisfy the conditions for being a refugee from both states, right? And this kind of, um, you know, restriction uh, may affect North Koreans, and it actually does. Um, I sometimes, uh, get requests from uh, foreign courts and um, lawyers about uh, the status of North Korean in, Koreans in, in, in South Korea. And there was one case uh, from Australia, and um, there was a uh, North Korean guy who applied for refugee status in Australia. And that person, he thought, didn't want to come to North, uh, South Korea. Right? He didn't want to, want uh, South Korean citizenship. He just want to uh, argue that he was a North Korean, and um, uh, but um, Australian, um, the Australian tribunal was having difficulty uh, about this question. And um, my opinion was that um, that person's citizenship of the Republic of Korea is not effective because he doesn't want it. And he may not be a, he, he may even if he comes to Korea he may not be he may not be recognized as a as, as a North Korean and as as a result as a, a national of the Republic of Korea so it is totally ineffective you should not treat him as a as a national of the of, of the Republic of Korea but anyway he his his application was dismissed because um, he he had a country to go to. Um, even though he doesn't want it, he, there is a country that would accept him. That's South Korea. So his um, re, you know, application should be dismissed. That was the position taken by the Austria, Australian Tribunal. So this kind of question arises uh, when North Koreans are concerned. Um, so at this point, um, I, I'm thinking about you know, uh, this uh, re- kind of conceptualizing of the citizenship membership of Koreans on the Korean Peninsula, uh, Koreans. Uh, there are formerly nationals, but, but unable to enjoy citizenship. You know, these people, North Koreans. Particularly, well, uh, in South Korea, there's a law named the Act on the Protection and Settlement Support of Residents Escaping from North Korea. And according to that law, not all North Koreans are protected. The protection means you know, bringing that person, admitting that person to South Korea and treat him, treat, treating him as a citizen of the Republic of Korea. But South Korea doesn't give protection to all, all, all North Koreans. If a North Korean has been uh, outside, outside of the Korean Peninsula for, for example, for 10 years or more, he's not protected. And these people are formally and very theoretically sit nationals of the Republic of Korea, but he doesn't enjoy any right as a national or as a citizen of the Republic of Korea. Uh, so I think I'm well, then what if that person, then should that person be treated as a foreigner and should that person you know, go through naturalization or re reinstatement of nationality to obtain the citizenship of the Republic of Korea? No, that person should not be treated as a foreigner. Then what happens? If that person proves himself to be a North Korean, uh, who also satisfies the conditions of being a national under the South Korean Nationality Act, if he proves himself or if he is, um, you know, uh, if that person wants to come to North Korea and he, he, he satisfies all these conditions, then he is automatically a citizen of the Republic of Korea, right? 
So at this point, I'm thinking about whether we should uh, introduce a kind of distinction between citizenship and nationality, as just like in, in the United States, or at least a dormant and um, active nationality. Um, you know, there are these, these North Korea's um, nationality is dormant, sleeping, but when he, South Korea you know, recognizes him as a North Korean to be protected, his citizenship become, uh, wakes up, wakes up, becomes active. I think this, um, this, uh, the, same, uh, the same logic can apply to uh, so-called Chosen Seki uh, Koreans in Japan. Uh, there are about 34,000 so-called Chosen Seki Koreans in Japan, Zainichi Koreans, who, are, who refuse to be who refuse to register as nationals of the Republic of Korea. They just remain on the Japanese alien register as nationals of Joseon instead of the Republic of Korea. That doesn't mean that they are necessarily DPRK citizens. They simply don't like uh, the national division. They simply don't like uh, the Republic of Korea, uh, the regime. And they they are treated as stateless persons, but what is their, their, their position? What is their status in South Korean law? Uh, one case shows that um, Chong Yong Han, Chong Yong Han uh, is a Zainichi, um, Cho Sen Seki Zainichi scholar who, is a, who doesn't like, who is a very uh, you know, radical critic of the South Korean government. <laughs> So uh, during uh, the Romanian presidency, he was often invited to South Korea, but during the um, Lee Myung-bak presidency, he was refused. Uh, so he, well, for those people, so Jo Sen Seki Koreans, the Korean government usually gives um, a travel document, a special travel document to tra for, th for them to travel to South Korea, but. Um, uh, the Lee myung government did not refuse to give him a travel document, and he sued the government. So there was a kind of uh, court case, and uh, in the district court, um, he, he won the case, but the uh, uh, Seoul High Court said that this guy was a stateless person. The, you know, and um, a, a stateless person is like a foreigner, and um, you know, the South Korean government had discretion whether to admit that person or not. So the South Korean government's refusal was justified or illegal. Um, that was, um, his appeal was quashed in uh, the Supreme Court, although the Supreme Court did not uh, spell out, uh, you know, declare that he was a stateless person, but nevertheless, his appeal was quashed. So, you know, that means the South Korean court, the judiciary, looked you know, regards these Joseon Seki Koreans as stateless persons, not Koreans. Right? I think this is um, an erroneous decision in the light of, in the light of all these, you know, historical process through which, you know, the members of the Korean nation came to be citizens of the Republic of Korea, and um, Chang Young Wan. Um, is already in Korea. I mean, he now under Moon Jae-in government, so uh, he's really uh, traveling to South Korea. And um, there is a seminar uh, that he will appear uh, in, in uh, next week, and I'm going to uh, attend the seminar. So I'm going to meet him, and I ask him whether he wants to, um, you know, he, he, at that point, and you know, in the very last stage of the litigation, he he said he was a uh, republic uh, citizen of the Republic of Korea. And um, I'm going to ask him whether he really identifies himself as a citizen of the Republic of Korea. Then why not use the Korean passport and so on? Right. Okay, um, because what time do I have to finish? Uh, yeah. Now? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, okay, what do you think about you? So I'll just um, give a very short, um, short outline of uh, what I'm going to say. 
uh, in the remaining part of the speech, the arrival of the old diaspora, as I said, Koreans um, institutionalized uh, a special status for you know, kin foreigners, foreigners who are treated differently from other foreigners by reason of co-ethnicity. Koreans, ethnic Koreans in China, ethnic Koreans in, in the so former in the CIS countries, ethnic Koreans, of course, in the United States and, and Japan, right? Um, these people came to be treated actually well, you know, the our, the draft in the minds of the drafters of the of the Nationality Act of nineteen forty eight and also the drafters of the DPRK Nationality Act of 1963. All these people had in mind some sort of a Korean nationhood, right? All these people belong to that nation, okay? And they, they uh, according to the South Korean explanation, they did not lose their nationality on the Japanese rule, right? And then how did they become citizens? Uh, it, it, they, how they they, they became treated as foreigners by the Republic of Korea. When did it happen? Um, my research shows that the Republic of Korea stopped its administrative practice of treating these people as possessing, continuing to possess the nationality of the Republic of Korea in 1997. So until 1997, their status was in a very murky state, right? And um, after, in 1997, well, this is a very, should be a very lengthy explanation, so I'll skip it. Uh, it was only in 1997 that when um, South, the South Korea's uh, Ministry of Justice introduced what is called the guidelines on the nationality affairs of co-ethnics from China, that they came to be treated definitively as foreigners. Uh, according to that, those guidelines, um, ethnic Koreans in China, or Chaozianzu or Chosonjo, these people lost their Korean nationality and citizenship as late as in on the 1st of October, uh, 1949, when the People's Republic of Korea, uh, China was declared. Um, until then, they possessed the Korean nationality. So people born after that period, that time, have, have to uh, uh, go through the naturalization process in order to obtain uh, the uh, citizenship of the Republic of Korea, whereas people born before then could obtain their uh, obtain uh, cit the citizenship of the Republic of Korea by reinstatement reinstatement of nationality, and um, so because they were you know as soon as they were removed these people were removed from the citizenry of the Republic of Korea, uh, they um, they there's a South Korea you know came up with this notion, this um, institutionalized notion of uh, co-ethnics, co-ethnics of foreign nationality, who are defined as former nationals and their descendants up to three generations, that means up to uh, grandchildren, and these people can obtain different statuses from, you know, visa statuses given to ordinary foreigners. Uh, their visa status can be F4, or H2. Um, this kind of privilege is pre preferential treatment is given to these people. And um, there is a controversy as regards whether this kind of practice is too nationalistic. And I think um, we can discuss this um, as, uh, you know, after my speech, uh, whether this kind of uh, practice is really ethno so odd or an excessively nationalistic and so on. And I would, I uh, made a research and um, I found out all these um, European cases, many European cases of preferential treatment of co-ethnics. Um, well, I made this kind of uh, template 
to compare these European practices. Not just Europe, but India also has that kind of um, system. So Turkey also has that kind of law that gives preferential treatment to uh, Turkish people outside of Turkey who are nationals of the uh, country of residence. Okay? So we can discuss this later. The, my last question, uh, my last uh, you know, the issue that, the last issue that I was going to address is the problem of identification. It is meaningless, even though you, have, you are a legal member, it is meaningless if you cannot prove that, prove who you are. And this kind of a personal identification problem and determination of one's status, this is a big problem in Korea. Uh, when the South Korean government faces people claiming that they are from North Korea, and people claiming that they have Korean ethnic origin, their ancestors were former nationals, and so on. And, um, um, you know, Korea has introduced many kind of ways of proof for this these people, and one, is, one of them is uh, DNA testing. <laughs> and um, for North Koreans, um, is this, uh, North Koreans are different from uh, these people because um, um, what, what is really important in determining their North Korean status is more performative than documentary because documents they, they are coming up with um, are suspected to be you know, forged and so on. So what is important is their memory. And uh, South Korean authorities are you know, examining their memories, uh, whether they have correct memory and correct understanding of the North Korean situation and so on. So many, some people fail to be recognized as North Korea because they fail to satisfy the South Korean authorities that they are truly North Korea. And these people face a huge difficulty. For example, they actually, they, some people live in South Korea without any documents, any status. Well, recently the South Korean government is giving them a kind of tentative um, status called G1, but until then, they, there are people who have absolutely no documents and didn't really, they don't exist in, official, uh, in the official world. And this kind of problem happens in uh, as we, uh, we in in, in uh, connection with uh, the, the North Korean migration to South Korea, and I think I have to stop here. Uh, although, although I have not exhausted all my <laughs> uh, all the information that I came up, uh, but um, I think we have to stop here. And um, I like to invite you to ask questions, and we can continue our discussion in that way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.